in 2004, we had been married for three years. We used to travel outside of Mexico every year. He was working as a logistic manager, and I was to work in a finance area in a, one of the biggest company, companies in Mexico. We were planning to make a family, to have kids, and we wanted to continue growing up our careers. We were at that point uh, when we were targeted for this, this cartel. We saw an increase in Mexican refugees about four years ago, four to five years ago. And what was quite striking almost from the beginning was the kind of persons they were. Uh, they tended to be upper middle class professionals, not poor people, but not really rich either. And they were people who felt that they had exhausted their options within Mexico. And what was uh, important and interesting for us almost from the beginning was that the people that we were actually meeting were quite different from the stereotype of the Mexican economic migrant that was being presented on, in the news. I worked for uh, 18 years uh, in Mexico from 2004 pro yeah 2004 when I was uh, hired by the one of the most influential newspapers in Mexico, which is Grupo Reforma. I start to work more uh, actively in um, border issues, but uh, with a focus on uh, organized crime. We were targeted for a drug cartel uh, after we made a complaint in the police because we were assaulted in the International Airport of Mexico City. So from September 2004, uh, to May 2008. We made well, all of the efforts uh, to move to different cities and different towns through Mexico. Uh, we left in 2004 to other city. We left to another small town. Then we came back to Mexico City because they found us everywhere. They all had difficulties with their refugee claims, which was quite shocking because as we listened to the stories, they were very compelling usually quite well documented. Uh, and by that time, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch were reporting on the significant human rights abuses and threats that were happening in Mexico. War on drugs started in, in uh, December 1st, 2006. The estimations are now they're around 40,000 people have been murdered in Mexico. Well, the, the problem is that every Mexican claims, in my opinion, has two very important components. One is the chaotic situation in Mexico. It's obviously that there is violence, there is, uh, you know, uh, 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 threats against their life, um, you know, many things happen in, in the chaotic situation of Mexico. And the chaotic situation for me means that the government is not capable of protecting their citizens. A friend of mine who was a, a, a well-known lawyer in, in Ciudad Juarez, he was murdered. And uh, I was the only the reporter who uh, investigate a little bit deeper and I published the names of uh, some well-known uh, criminals that uh, this uh, friend of mine denounced a week before he was murdered. At least 10% of the cases uh, are accepted and, and that doesn't depend uh, of how genuine or how, um, how serious the case is. That depends on very subjective things. One is who is the board member in front of you. Some board members have a, a little bit the door open for some Mexican claims. Other ones are seal of tolerance, and they reject 99 or 95 or 100 percent of the Mexican claims. So you don't have a chance. That's a matter of the case that you have. And quite frankly, um, 90 percent of the asylum claims being made by Mexican citizens are being rejected as unfounded by our Independent Immigration Refugee Board. That indicates to us uh, a massive 
uh, gaming of the Canadian system, a, viola a, a violation and abuse of our generosity. I, I, I keep working, I keep doing my work in Mexico until the violence and the threats spread into my family. Because once that the violence or the, the threats spread or, or the level of risk that I was involved uh, spread into my family, that's when I decided to leave. We have this bank manager who's working as a house painter for cash for six dollars an hour. Like, this is a sign of how afraid people are that you would trade a really good lifestyle for a six dollar an hour job. So we started doing jobs that I I learned a lot and I, I really appreciate that job because I wasn't able to to clean my washroom honestly. So I learned how to clean office I had I learned how to clean the rooms in the hotels and it helps you a lot uh, to learn other other things in the life and give value to all of the things that I had before. Nobody talk about the prejudice. But you have a Minister of Immigration saying every single month we are doing this against the bogus claims. And he is referring exactly to the Mexican claims. So in that case, and he did many things to stop the intake of uh, claims from Mexico. He imposed a visa. Um, he removed uh, the category in the safe third country agreement in order that Mexicans that are not living illegally in the United States can come to the border and make a claim. So he is really taking very seriously the stopping of the intakes of refugees, particularly the ones that he defines as abogos, particularly Mexicans. They say if they go back to their country of origin, they're going to be persecuted. That doesn't make a lot of sense for people who are coming from Western democracies like Czech Republic in the European Union or Mexico. Now, both of those countries have challenges and they have problems, like so do we. The, um, one of the uh, distinctive things of this organization is the level of cruelty. Uh, they are uh, decapitating people, they are killing women, they are killing families, uh, and they are doing that as a way to show, uh, to be respected, to be feared more than respected, to be feared because of the level of violence that they use. When you are completely scared to be tortured, to be kidnapped, to be killed for these people, you are able to, to change everything in your life. Obviously, there were plans to have family, to have kids. Like, it's no possible to have kids in, in, in this situation, how you can bring kids to this life with this situation. We have to leave our families, we have to leave our house, we have to leave everything. I think that the, the wish is to get a normal life again. If you go outside in the street, if you go to your job, if you drive or you take the bus or you walk, you feel safe. You don't feel that you have to turn your head every single second in order to see who is behind you or who going to attack you or who going to take you and bring you inside of a car and who going to kill you or who going to it's like you have to change everything because it's your life. It's the only thing that you have, right? The greatest injustice has been for the Minister of Immigration publicly to say that all Mexicans are here for economic reasons. And the kind of trickle-down effect that this has had almost immediately on the members of the Refugee Board. Uh, and then I would say it's been a great injustice uh, that all of the documents that have been introduced into refugee hearings from Amnesty International, the Mexican Human Rights Center, Human Rights Watch, all of those documents are virtually ignored in every decision. Well, the response was uh, that our claim was rejected. Uh, the answer was basically for three reasons. Uh, the first one was based that Mexico is a democracy, and as a, as a citizen of Mexico, we could get protection from the Mexican government. The second reason was based on the idea or the criteria that the drug cartel, which persecutes us, was 
only about 50 people. And other thing is that this drug cartel has been named, has been called from the U.S. government as the most dangerous drug cartel in the world. And the third reason was that because even we were persecuted for four years after we made a complaint in the in, in the police, the immigration officer said that I had to ask for help again. So we were kidnapped, we were tortured, we were persecuted for four years because we made a complaint in the police. That was the reason. I believe that the Refugee Board did not accept these and many other Mexican claims uh, because of political factors, that Canada is in a free trade zone with Mexico. Uh, the Mexican government is very anxious to show to both Canada and the states that it's a safe place, that the government has control of the economic, political, and uh, security situation in the country. It's, it's extremely important for Mexico to appear to be a safe place. Honestly, it's one of the hardest moments in my life. I felt like completely empty, alone, without any protection. Like if you are taken in the lions, like in a room with lions, nobody wanted to, to save your life. Now, the ones that have gone back have usually had to change their name, change their identity documents, change their occupation, the place they live. So they're living a kind of a, a false life, but they have to do that. Uh, but there are some people who've said, we just, we can't do that. And there is nothing that we can do from if they are in, in Mexico. But as I said, the number of people contacting us, you know, is, is increasing or triple. The second thing is, we have managed to prove that some people that have been sent back to Mexico have been killed. We won a case of the, the Mexican women and two daughters that were removed to Mexico. The oldest daughter was killed. You know? And, and the, the daughter was killed in a, in a way that is unbelievable how violent that crime was and and the the um, the symbols of uh, you know hate against her gender and violence because women and all the things that they were claiming here we will look back on this period of history with great shame i imagine a future prime minister standing up in the house of commons and apologizing to mexicans that at a moment when many of them were desperate for a safe and secure place, we closed the doors. When you, when you have a rejection and rejection and rejection, it's, it's really hard to understand, to understand why they don't want to read your evidence, they don't want to read your reasons, only because you are from Mexico. And, and sometimes you only think that the only way is, is is to disappear from this world, honestly. And I, 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 I thought so many times, yeah, I, I was like, so many times like thinking that was the only way to, like, to be safe. That the minister can designate some countries as safe. Uh, it will be a problem not just for Mexicans, but for all kinds of people. And it will be the end of the integrity of the Canadian refugee system. Because it will be a purely political decision uh, which countries are deemed safe and which ones aren't. And when you are rejected and when you came back to your country and when you are facing that situation and when you have to live here, you don't have any other option because you tried and you didn't get the opportunity. So it's a kind of life that we have to, to, to have here in, in Mexico, like you are in your, your jail. Maybe you have to, you can decorate your jail, but it's your jail, at least, at the end.